All right, and yes, we are live. Everything is working. Hello, welcome to SCGC. It is Thursday night, 9 p.m. Believe it or not, there are people out there in the audience and on the show who are not at Avengers right now. What a bunch of losers. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So welcome to SDGC. Uh, bunch we of talk nerds about, don't want to go. I know that's b- bunch of nerds not see want to stay and talk about video gaming. Dude, this is a <laughs> service we provide. Um, anyway, since most everyone else is gone, we have a couple of guests with us tonight. Um, I am Derek. I am one of the show regulars. I also have Brandon with us. Uh, Brandon is one of our show regulars. Brandon, how's it going, man? What is up, dude? I'm good, man. Yeah, uh, we also have Lena up in the other corner. Lena, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks yeah, for having me on. this is your first time on the show. Lena is uh, my sister and Lena is an amateur game developer and a moderator and member of the community for us at SDGC. Um, and we figured, uh, you know, great time to have a small guest on. And then, of course, our favorite NPD analyst, Matt Piscatella. How are you doing, man? Good. How you guys doing? Always fun to chat. I know. Always good to have you on, man. Although we got kind of scared for a little bit there getting you set up, but <laughs> <laughs> it always works itself out of me. Yeah, I got the, the Bioware magic coming through. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> so, um, I figure let's get right into the thick of things. Um, Matt, just a couple of days ago, uh, NPD, you all released the uh, March of 2019 sales results. So why don't you give us the most salient information out of there? What do you think is most important to take note of? Uh, I think, you know, the, the key things happening right now are that the Switch continues to have a really strong year uh, with pretty solid growth year on year. Um, but we're at that point in the cycle for the PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, where things are just going to, you know, slow down until we get into the next generation of consoles. Very typically, or very typical and very normal for uh, cyclical uh, behavior. Um, it's just the Switch is doing a lot of work to try to, to offset some of those declines. Overall, like in March, we were down 11% as a market, really dragged down by hardware. Um, but for the quarter, like for Q1, the market was only down 2%. Uh, software and accessories were both up for the quarter, but we did have some hardware declines. So, you know, that's the, the big picture really is Switch is doing a lot of work. Um, but when you look at the titles, um, Tom Clancy's The, the Division 2 uh, came out on top uh, for the month of March. Sekiro uh, came in at number two, and then MLB The Show, uh, which set a new record both for the show and for a baseball game in history uh, huh. with the biggest launch month of sales uh, we've ever seen. So, um, you know, just last March, we had Far Cry 5 show up. That was a massive hit. And uh, the games this year really couldn't just reach those uh, those kind of sales levels that Far Cry 5 hit. So um, nothing too unexpected in the numbers. Um, you know, people always like it when things go up. Um, but sometimes things just go down. Yeah. Now, I will say a couple of things um, that I thought were noteworthy, and maybe you can tell me if if I'm crazy for this. Um, Sekiro, correct me if I'm wrong, came out very, very late in March um, and still managed to hit second overall on the charts, and that's not counting PC digital sales, correct? That's right. Activision is not a member of the uh, digital leader panel for PC. Okay, so I mean, you know, and, and I, bl- I believe that's also the case for Tom Clancy's The Division. So, but I mean, that means that the, both of those games did fantastic for being relatively late in the month. Um, I think Tom Clancy was later, right? Somebody correct me. I don't remember. I, don't right. I, I, don't I think remember it was. Either. I can check. Um, it was interesting to see. I think Sekiro and Devil May Cry both in the top five uh, because we keep getting told that those kind of games are dead. Uh, and yet we have these two big single-player experiences that were within the top five alongside some big multiplayer titles. So I, I, you know, call me reading too far into it, but I kind of feel like that that says that the idea that there's any one single way to make a game is, uh, is, is, as people keep banging that drum, is a little silly. Um, Now, Matt, I hope you remember, because I don't, um, it's weird to me not to see Pokemon on this list. Um, and I don't remember if it was in the February top 20 either, but I didn't see it anywhere in the top 20 this month. Um, and that was a massive hit, I thought, back in the holidays. And I, I usually Pokemon games have some pretty good legs, don't they? 
Yeah, they usually do. I mean, this is the first time that it's on a console platform, which is a little weird. And uh, Pokemon Let's Go, I mean, it depends on who you ask about uh, its place in the Pokemon realm of video games. I think what we're going to see with uh, the Pokemon RPG this year is probably a little more reflective of its staying power. Yeah, it's it's fallen off the top the top 20. You know, one other thing to keep in mind is that uh, Nintendo is not a member of the digital leader panels. This does not include digital sales for Nintendo. So even though there's a lot of Nintendo games on the top 20, they are underrepresented as a whole. So if you threw digital on there, does Pokemon show up? Maybe. Who knows? Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and, and to your point on the single-player game thing, I did actually did a, a look at this uh, a couple weeks ago and looked at the share of sales of the top 20 games that are from single-player games. And the overall percentage of that has fallen, but there are still plenty of single-player games that do very well, generally open-world single-player games, generally expansive worlds. Um, so I don't know. I think people talk a lot more about how single player games aren't dead than they do single player games are dead. Uh, but hey, man, everyone should live their dream. That's fair. That's fair. And see, this is why you're the best. You're, you're like doing the pre work, like coming in here. It's like, man, I already got some numbers on these single player games. Well, now I gotta go find. I gotta go find that tweet I did and uh, and throw it in the chat here. It's yeah. a pretty cool little chart I made. <laughs> yeah, oh, man, you're, and by the way, anybody in chat who does not follow Matt Piscatella on Twitter, if you are interested in more, like, hard gaming industry news, I mean, the, the, the breakdowns on, like, layman's terms that you put out there on Twitter and the, like, charts and graphs you throw up there are, I mean, you put out some fantastic, easy-to-follow data for, like, people who are, whether they're, like, super hardcore actually following and reporting on the news or just casually interested in this stuff. That's great to hear. That's what I'm trying to do, and let just let people in a little bit as into the into the weeds of uh, game sales planning and, and how this all works. Because, man, it's all weird uh, and messed up. So, yeah. if I can do a little bit to help, then that's great. Yeah. Well, we always treasure when we get to have you on, man. Um. So, does anybody else have any questions about um the March results? No. Um. But just to clarify, uh, Tom Clancy came out on the 15th. Sekiro came out on the 22nd. Okay. Okay. So, so like, middle of the month. I mean, that's still, that's, that's super impressive to be number one with basically half a month of sales. Um, it was, it was, it didn't want, it didn't beat Division 1, though, right? Because is Division 1 still the most successful launch in Ubisoft history? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, it was, it was behind uh, the Division 1. Division 2 was the sixth biggest launch in Ubisoft history. Okay. Um, so, so overall, a, a very strong launch, but the Division One was uh, yeah, that was like I mean, on there's a whole like, other level that that had Ubisoft saying we think of ourselves in a pre-division, post-division world. <laughs> well, and the nice hey, thing man, is, fair enough. Yeah, Ubisoft is really good at keeping like majorly online multiplayer like service type games alive. I just um, noticed today that there was Crew Crew Two DLC coming out like on Steam. Today. What? I was like, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was like, wait, I was like, they're still supporting the Crew Two? That is man, but like Ubisoft is killer it. So like, okay, maybe Division Two launched a little under Division One, but it's gonna do them super well. It'll have great legs, um, and they're they're they have probably the best track record in the industry at keeping these service type games alive long term uh which gives us a perfect segue into um another smaller piece of news uh that has come out uh speaking of games getting updates long term uh we got word that anthem ea has has effectively said that anthem's major feature updates are postponed in indefinitely i don't think is the exact uh, words that they used. Um, I can try to pull up what the exact verbiage was, but that's kind of the gist of it. Um, Brandon, man, what here in this news, what does this make you think about Anthem? And it's already kind of rocky. Like, it sold very, very well, but it had this rocky reputation yeah. for a launch, and, and it reviewed fairly poorly. Like it's probably, like, bleeding players. It's like people... There's, you know, there's, like, there's no long-term loot. Like, it's not really, like, a loot game. Yeah. It, like, it kind of is, but it's not. <laughs> it doesn't Me? have the long-term hook. So, I, I don't know. Like, I'm so, Obviously, I, I got the game for free with my graphics card, but then I didn't play it. Yeah. 
So I, yeah, like I'm not really interested in it. I'm certainly not going to go back to it or reinstall it or anything like that. Yeah. Lena, I think before I'm the show, you were sure. talking about, Lena, you're talking about player numbers. Did you, you had some. Yeah. Um, they, they did a survey on, um, Reddit on r slash Anthem game Which... and about it, oh, just over 50% of the players that already quit playing the game since launch. Um, and another roughly third of them were considering quitting because of this, the lack of support. So, you I know, mean, once it's... that happened, that's, you know, 66% of their player base. Yeah. Well, it's worth talking about the fact that, like, that's that's not going to be wholly representative. You're talking about the Reddit community, which is probably a very hyper-vocal, hyper-online community as opposed to the broader gaming base. But, I mean, if, if you're most engaged and most online players are feeling that way, that's, that's probably not a, a I mean, great yeah. indication. I feel like those people just went out and bought the division too. <laughs> uh, numbers like, kind of like, back it up. <laughs> people that were waiting for, you know, Anthem content just were just like, ah, fuck it. I guess I'll get this or division. No, yeah. I, uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of where the service game, uh, market follows, right? Like if you can't keep the game fresh and updated with content, then it's hard to maintain players long term. And that hurts if you've got long-term monetization plans built into the game as well. Um, now, stick a pin in that, because we're definitely going to come back to that with a later topic that's much <laughs> more serious. But before we get into, like, the really, really heavy stuff, um, there's not a whole lot to say more about Anthem. I think it's in trouble. Matt, do you have anything else to add in before we move on? Uh, yeah, just a, a bit on that. So what we're seeing uh, in the data and in player account and movement is that um, you know, before with these kind of games, there'd be one or two games out in the market, like a, a Destiny and then a Division. Now there's a bunch more, and folks are gravitating towards certain games, and when a game's hot, everyone jumps on board. When a game's not, everyone bails. Um, so it is, it is really important to keep people engaged and keep people coming back. I think even games like Apex are running into some challenges of keeping that going. So there's a there's a a lot of gold at the end of that rainbow, um, but man, uh, it's really easy for people to fall off of that curve. So um, it'd be really interesting to see how this develops over the next few years. Yeah, that's true. And Apex, Apex is, is I mean, name dropping Apex has had some difficulties um, keeping its player base, we're finding out, uh, especially in terms of uh, it's, it's not able to put out content as quickly as if you want to talk free to play battle royales, I mean, Fortnite is the king and anthem was coming to take a piece of that pie and they can't keep pace with Fortnite. now i want you all to like highlight all of that in like green like le flashing <laughs> legend of zelda text because that's going to be really important later uh, yeah. <laughs> but i really don't want to get into that that is a piece of evidence for the later trial right um we're playing <laughs> phoenix right ties here into itself very well yeah yeah we're gonna come full yeah, circle as, at the as end you'll find out by the end it's rare that it works out that well um now, we did have one major release a couple of days ago. Uh, Mortal Kombat 11 finally dropped on uh, on everything, right? Switch, PlayStation, yeah. Xbox, yeah. PC. Um, I've been playing on PC. It's mostly a good port. There's a couple technical issues. Switch port looks... I think it looks good. I don't know if you all have seen, like, it, screenshots It looks like Mortal footage. Kombat without lighting. Yeah, it's and it's it's surprisingly good, considering it's on a handheld, That's effectively. Six, yes. Yeah. Um, there has been a lot of controversy around <laughs> Mortal Kombat 11 in the last week or two. Um, and I don't know that all of it's earned. Um, the first, and I'll say, let's, let's say the most actual complex and most serious uh, piece of criticism the game is under currently is the game's progression system. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard, Mortal Kombat 11 has like a billion pieces of of gear and augments and things that you can customize your character with, and that's all unlocked through this in-game progression system that's tied to a kind of pseudo-randomized like challenge towers called the Towers of Time. Um, these challenges are incredibly poorly balanced, um, and they give not nearly enough of the in games. There's like five different in game currencies um, in terms of resources to actually turn around and purchase. 
is one of them coins with a K? Yes, yes, Hell it's yeah. okay. Hell yeah. I haven't <laughs> you bought know. the game, I just needed to know that. You, you know that Mortal Kombat has them coins with a K. <laughs> um, but that got a lot of people really upset because there are some in-game purchases. You can purchase like time crystals that help you um, nullify some of the negative like modifiers in the challenges um and there are there is an in-game shop where you can buy certain premium pieces of gear and outfits and people are really frustrated with the progression and then people are really frustrated with the usual like there's loot boxes there's microtransactions but i don't know how much you all have looked into this but it doesn't really look there's actually that much in terms of microtransactions to to get into it seems like this is a time thing so yeah the initial the, the knee-jerk reaction to it was somebody went through and they looked at every skin for every character and they determined based on what they saw certain skins for sale for how much it would cost overall and they ended up being over sixty four hundred dollars but you can't actually purchase all of them with in-game money okay. or with real money rather um most of them you have to grind for Plus, it's a rotating shop, isn't it? So it's like random. Yeah, there's like five things you can purchase at any given time. So yeah, just like Fortnite. Yeah. yeah. So, and, so and that's stuff you can buy with real money. But if you're lucky and get what you want. So there's been a lot of, of criticism where they say the game was not built. Uh, a community manager came out and said the game was not built to facilitate microtransactions. And and that's literally true because there's not really much in the way of in-game purchases. Um, you know, there's you can't buy an in-game currency there's there's very little to actually buy or spend real money on in the game it's just a big time block of you've got to spend 40 years <laughs> unlocking everything um now matt we were talking about service games and and finding ways to keep people engaged over time mortal kombat dropped with an awful lot in it do we see many games or do you see many successful service games that drop with a lot of content and then just force you to spend forever getting the small pieces like gating it off over time or uh well considering i'm addicted to mlb the show and there's a <laughs> lot of stuff in there that i gotta i know i'm gonna grind for the next six months to get uh probably not the best person to ask <laughs> uh, now you know like a lot of games are, are, you know, everyone's still testing the waters on what works and what doesn't work in this kind of environment. And whether it's, whether you want to call them live games now, which I guess is the new hot terminology for them because games as a service a now mouthful. has a little bit of it's dust a little wordy. on it. But yeah, and it, and it has a little abbreviated little radiation. Gas. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I think it's what's interesting is that all these people, all these people, whether it's Ubisoft or it's EA or whoever it is, are adjusting these things over time. Um, MK has taken an um, interesting approach to day one for this content because it is chock full of stuff. Um, but, yeah, I imagine they're going to be doing a lot of tweaking to the in-game economy and how people have to grind for this stuff. Uh, I'm not sure. We'll have to see. But, yeah, everyone keeps experimenting. For sure. Yeah. Um, it is worth noting that uh, the the team at NetherRealm has come out and said that they did not intend for it to take this much time. Um, that they uh, they've dropped, I think, uh, already like a couple of hot fixes, and they're doing more updates to adjust the difficulty and the payout um, within the the Towers of Time mode, where you're going to do most of your grinding out. Um, so it seems like they agree that they missed the mark. Some it'll be kind of interesting to see where they hit um but for those of you if you're if you're seeing and hearing all of this discourse about mortal kombat 11 and, and microtransactions but um, aside from that it seems like the best mortal kombat game oh, ever made so i've been of... loving it I've, I've spent the past couple days playing it i'm a big mortal kombat fan i make no bones of that um i i like how it's moved kind of in a more progressive direction once again pin in that um you know but like the games the gameplay is as good as it's ever been i love the gear customization it's my favorite part of injustice 2 um i think they've done a really good job of adapting mortal kombat to what modern gamers want and what modern business needs require like for the most part i think it has transitioned into a a, a live game relatively well um it takes a lot of elements from its mobile 
There's a mobile Mortal Kombat, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah, and they do they that did. with everything. Yeah. They do that with Mortal Kombat X, and they did it with Injustice 2, and it was no surprise they, they have a mobile game for... It's a very simple, you know, swipes and taps, but it, it's kind of fun. You know, you get some extra bonus points if you link them up. Um, yeah, I think you get an announcer, too, a, a custom announcer if you link them together. Yeah, you get, like, Shao Kahn, huh. or, or I don't remember for sure, but you get, the, you get, you get some, guy? some little, oh, I wish, man, that'd be, <laughs> I hope, that'd be great, I haven't looked it, into every little like thing. like, the nostalgic Mortal Kombat, like, this one has time travel, so it's all about, like, going yes. back to the old Mortal Kombat. Yes, so you so get yeah, the old and new versions. Guy. <laughs> yeah, why not, y'all, come on. Um, so, one of the, uh, we talk about Mortal Kombat updating itself for kind of a modern era and, and becoming maybe a little bit more um, mindful and how it presents its characters. Um, there's, there's been a lot of, a lot of angry nerds about these, uh, these costumes changes, especially on the women. Um, a lot of experts on time travel. Yeah, <laughs> that too. <laughs> so, a, obviously, anytime you have a, a game franchise that decides it wants to maybe treat its female characters a little bit less like mannequins for revealing outfits, you get people on the internet who are mad. I think I've seen the hashtag boner culture used unironically. <laughs> I can see Matt, like, squinking his face up in pain. <laughs> like, yep. <laughs> we know those types. <laughs> Video games were My a mistake after all. <laughs> yeah, video games are a mistake. And that we're going to be saying that more and more as this episode goes on. Don't worry. And then, um, yeah, one of my favorite things, unironically, one of my favorite things. Um, I tell you what, Brandon, I'll toss this over to you uh, if you want to talk about Jax's arcade ending <laughs> that has people in a tizzy because it's so good. It's something about Jax. I, Jax always has to have the best endings in all Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I mean, obviously, the, the Mortal Kombat 4 Jax ending. Yes. Legendary, immortal and legendary. So, and, and I guess what I could only consider a bid to one up uh, that, they, they decided to have him uh, travel back in time and. I don't, I don't remember. So I did watch the ending, but I don't remember exactly how he goes about doing what he I mean, does. they don't explain the exact well, details. Okay. All right, but... yeah, so I'll let you take yeah. it over. What, do, what does he do with okay. his... So his basically, he... Because I guess within, you know, the, the main villain, Mortal Kombat 11, is this, like, time goddess character. So when you beat arcade mode, your character gets the ability to kind of rewrite history the way they think it should have been rewritten. And Jax rewrites history so that... Basically, bigotry doesn't happen. Like, the, the joking thing is Jax undid slavery, but they undid so much more than slavery. The idea is that, like, racial biases as a whole have disappeared. Uh, but Mortal Kombat undid slavery with one of its <laughs> endings, which is one of the best things that's, I'll ever get to say. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that was an option, and I'm going to be disappointed <laughs> in every game that comes out um, for the rest of the year that doesn't do that. Pokemon, the ball's in your court. Are you going to end slavery? <laughs> like, <laughs> Mortal Kombat. You, are, you, you just spoiled the ending of Detective Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lena, um, I'm sure you have seen a lot of shit out there. And uh, I want to know if, if you have any thoughts or, or just amusing comments about the backlash that this ending has gotten. Lena? Lena, did we lose you? Uh, she cares very deeply. <laughs> Thinking this response up. Matt, how about we toss it to you? said, oh no, we lost her. Oh, she's back. Lena, you okay? Yeah, no, Discord decided I was done. So Okay. okay. Well, let's, let's... You, you addressed me and then it immediately froze. <laughs> okay. Lena, this ending That's has awful. nerds mad. Why are they mad? Do they have any reason to be upset that Jax and Mortal Kombat undid slavery? No. Please explain the ethics in time travel. <laughs> I mean, if you could travel back in time and, and right any wrong ever, why wouldn't you do it? Like, honestly. Um, you know, I, mm, it, 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 it's, a, it's a gamer culture thing, unfortunately. <laughs> <That's racist>. uh, <laughs> there, there's some, uh, I feel like if, if, a, if, if a white person went back in time and did something like that, then, you know, it would be less of a problem. You're probably right. 
It's funny. I joked about it like at first it was hilarious, but I thought about it and it's like if you have time powers, there's there's almost very few like better things you could do than to eliminate the concept of of bigotry from human existence. Like that's almost one of the most selfless and pure-hearted things you could do Seriously. with time travel. Like, we're talking about Mortal Kombat. It's a game where people like appel each other on spikes and everyone hates each other and just wants to murder each other. Like, and a dude fixes a racism. Positive, a positive outlook on life. So, Matt, I need, I need the over-under. I need a yes or no on killing baby Hitler. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what if baby Hitler was a freaker? <laughs> I, I don't. Uh, so dumb. I don't know. Like, mortal, mortal, mortal Kombat. You're so frustrated. I love it. In the Mortal Kombat universe, uh, like it's just it's pure ridiculousness, and like we're having a conversation in this in the, on the internet about whether. It's right for slavery. Of course, it's right for slavery to get stopped. Stop it. <laughs> get some help. So, Seriously. is is anybody? So, I'm gonna. I don't know if I'm gonna show naivete. I I think I'm actually surprised by how. And it's a vocal minority, but I think I'm surprised by how vocal the internet backlash is, and how large this vocal minority is or feels like. I mean, it, about, it about ending slavery of all things. An all-time all message board meltdown post. Oh my god! You know that 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 reset era post. It was it, it like it, I mean, it, the ending miserable. was worth it for that post alone. Yeah, but I can't. I I did not believe that this would. I, I thought we'd see a couple of good shitty tweets from idiots. I did not think it was going to be a thing, like a capital T thing. Um, I did read that some people decided it was white genocide for, for him to do that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that too. I saw that <laughs> thrown around. It's usually a, a sign of a good argument coming up. <laughs> All right, well, once again, we're, we're going to come back to Mortal Kombat 11. There's yet another thing that's getting a pin stuck in it. Um, for our last smaller topic before we get into the real meat of things... Um, Days Gone also released. Um, and Days Gone, there's been some hot talk about these review scores. Um, Brandon, you've been keeping up on a lot of the discussion and a lot of the talk about Days Gone. Um, how, how are people enjoying it, first off, that you've seen? Mm. I, uh, mm. Okay, uh... <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I hesitate because of the way you phrased it. Uh, people aren't really enjoying it. Yeah. Base pro just okay on my personal Twitter feed. Any any anybody I follow that got an early review copy on my Twitter feed did not like it. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, I don't know. Reviews <laughs> I, I have seemed rough. Yeah, reviews have seemed rough. Um, I uh, you know, Lena, I don't know if you've seen any different. You know, I mean, let's start off I've with seen... the meta score is in the low sevens. Yeah, yes, I've seen really middling or eh reviews. It's see, that's funny because a seven to me like does isn't terrible, right? Like that's just like I, mean, I, I love Dying Light, and that game has like a seventy two or something like that. So yeah, yeah. so it, it's weird because it feels like people are, are are. I read a lot of these poll quotes from these reviews, and they can get scathing at times, and yet yeah, yeah, there's some harsh words a 70 that, doesn't really seem that bad what are the main criticisms I, why why is this game not what people wanted it not quite what people wanted it to be clap clap it feels like i mean a, a lot of reviews are basically just saying it feels like every other open world game you've already played 15 times already you know like the mad next thing you're, you're going around you're looking for gas it has very light survival elements you know there's a skill tree you're upgrading your abilities through combat like the you know progression of like a Far Cry game basically, yeah. but not. And then obviously the tone of the story. People have, I mean, you know, who's going into this expecting The Last of Us Part Two? But it's apparently 
Yeah, I mean, not, I, not a great story. I don't know. Yeah, I got to play it at at PAX um, when when I was up in Boston, and it felt like. I mean, I hate because I really don't like playing into these kind of conversations, but it, it felt like a a kind of cheaper The Last of Us in an open world style setting and format and. You know, I don't know how much I personally wanted a cheaper The Last of Us. You know, yeah. um, it, it looks ve- it looks very much like um, the Mad Max game that came out a few years ago, combined with like you know Last of Us, Walking Dead, Zombie. You know, yeah. So it, it feels like a combination of like the Sons of Anarchy television show. Mad Max open world game from a few years ago and zombie trends. Yeah, yeah it's like 2015 in like a time capsule, isn't it? Yeah. Like, yeah, very much. Yeah. So. All the biggest shows and hottest trends uh, from four years ago. Somebody in in I think it was our DM group in the SDGC uh, DM group was talking about how um, it felt like one of the potential major flaws with big open world games is they take so long to make that it can be very easy to end up you know dating yourself to four or five years ago with trends if you're trying to look at what's popular now then by yeah. the time your game comes out and yeah god, it's, god it's forbid five years you old. come out after a new grand theft auto game yeah or, oh, or a, new, yeah. An, a new rockstar game in general and stuff. yeah yeah so i um matt i know uh days gone as a big sony exclusive um has been a is probably Usually, those are the kind of games that are worth looking. I'm trying to think of even how to phrase this. What were you expecting out of Days Gone in terms of like forecasting? Were you thinking it'd do real well? Do you think it'd be middling? Uh, well, you always have to look at this within the realm of Sony first party exclusives, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, so they always perform fairly well, but they're not going to be at the very top of the charts um with a big multi-platform game like say the division two right Mm -hmm. um and review scores are becoming less and less predictive of what a game's going to do uh and we have fewer of these kinds of games hitting the market than we used to so while yeah the the metacritic's a little disappointing and and some of the the gifts out there are entertaining uh, with some of the stuff in them. Um, I'm thinking it actually does, it'll do either at or a little bit above what a similarly scored title could do. I mean, we'll just have to see. The market is strange these days. People still yeah. love zombies. And, zombies have not gone out of fashion. I mean, World War Z just sold, like, what, a million copies or something? Yeah, and we haven't had, like, a big single player open world game quite like this in a while um yeah since Red a few Dead months too, at least guess, yeah. yeah so yeah. there's runway for it for sure um but i mean is it going to be a breakout hit like spider-man probably not yeah, yeah. Yeah. so we'll have to wait and see because things are so weird on the market now like some games that have super high ratings are not selling very well and some games that are have middling rating scores are doing super well it's like yeah. i don't know what's going on yeah. yeah so you feel like like this is a game that can find find its success in doing well in the you know the april sales results and and maybe staying on the charts in in may or does this need like long legs well i mean these kind of games don't generally stay on the charts very long anymore if they're there for between two and four months it's generally pretty good a lot of these games are one and done in terms of the top sellers chart I mean, what you can never quite do is get an idea of the development costs or what the uh, profitability target is. So, like, determining if a game's a success or not, like, a game could, one game could sell 5 million copies and be a complete failure, yeah. while another game can sell 2 million and be a like, success. So, like Battlefield 5. Something. Yeah, that's also true. So, it, it makes it tough to define success or not. Is it going to find an audience? Probably. Is it going to be on the charts for four months? It's really hard for any game like this to be on the charts for four months. Um, the games that are holding onto the charts for four months these days are live service games that have an audience and Nintendo. Um, and of course, and Grand Nintendo. Theft Auto 5. <laughs> yeah, Grand Theft Auto 5, which will be on this chart after I'm dead. Uh, so I was going to say, was Grand Theft Auto 5 was number eight? 
this this uh, I mean, for the March results. Still like the most watched game on Twitch TV right now. Like, yeah. Like I mean, every single day. I could tell you about the GTA 5 RP stuff. Oh uh, yeah, I haven't I haven't looked too much. <laughs> it's <into> good. It. <laughs> <laughs> it's never gonna die, man. It's never gonna die. <laughs> Not till GTA 6 hits. The rest of us will, but GTA 5 will live forever. <laughs> A monument to our hubris. Yeah. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we've been kind of dancing around this to talk about a lot of the other subjects, uh, but it's time to move to some heavy, heavy news. Um, if, if. Lena, maybe if you want to see if you can find the original article and post it in the uh, Twitch chat here. Um, so I didn't already have it. Thank you. Um, there was this recent expose on Polygon about um, crunch and like working conditions at Epic Games. How in, does how does Fortnite get weekly content? Updates? Yeah, in particular in the in the uh, yeah in the Fortnite team. Um, and there's some really shocking uh, stuff in there. Now, a lot of it is stuff we've heard on way too many times before with way too many companies. Um, you know, there is this culture. I mean, e- EA Wives was like, what, 2004 or something? Yeah. Like culture of avoiding time off, um, you know, where it's not that you're not allowed to take time off, but if you do, then all your work's getting put on other people. And then that has people feel spiteful towards you and you feel guilty for it. So you're kind of like pressure. Yeah. Stockholm syndrome. You're kind of pressured into um, not taking your time off Um, people getting health issues from the amount of work that they're doing. I mean, apparently Um, you're allowed to take unlimited time off at Epic games. Yeah. But if you were to take any time off and then your department um, underperformed, then the people who took any time off are the first people to get fired. um, And they did get fired. Um, people, one of the, the shocking things to me was 70 to 100 hour work weeks for a lot of employees on the Fortnite team. 100 hour work weeks. I, a lot of, I mean, a lot of, they say it comes, it's their update pace. Like they said, they can't wait. If something is, if they push out a patch on Tuesday, and they break something, they can't wait till Thursday to patch it. They have to patch it Tuesday. Yeah, like, and they're not allowed to take if a weapon is broken. They're not allowed to take it offline while they work on it. They have to have it fixed immediately while also immediately. working on the upcoming patches um, and content drops. Yeah, they um, can't delay patches. Like, And, I, you know, I played Fortnite for a few months, and I saw it. Like, they would, you know, delay a patch by a day, and then they would still have the like second patch of the week on their normal time schedule, yeah. which means they were just staying up, you know, till 2 a.m. instead of midnight. Like, Yeah. Um, one thing that I did a little bit of very fuzzy math on very, very early one morning uh, as I was waiting to fall asleep. I um, So the average salary at Epic Games is, I think I looked it up, and it was something like 86000 from what's publicly, you know, released and available, which it means it's probably off a little bit in either direction. But best estimate we've got um, with with no resources otherwise. Um, If you're working a 100-hour work week on a salary of $86,000, you are making the equivalent of an hourly worker making less than $13 an hour. That's brutal, dude. I don't even want to talk about how much I make in my part-time job. (laughs) Yeah, less than $13 an hour. it's, It's about that. Yeah, less than $13 an hour. I can't imagine working for and I mean is it technically a little better in that they've got the money to actually pay their bills I mean kind of does it I mean do you feel like it matters that you can pay your mortgage if you can't ever go home to it like you know I mean somebody please chime it is depressing this is hard to hear about time and again it it seems like a very callous working environment the 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 term bodies being you throw more bodies at it you know you know where i heard the term throw more bodies at it when i was in the military and they're literally talking about like cannon fodder like yeah frontline cannon fodder was referred to as bodies like you know, you know, they're making video games. They're not on the front lines of war. It's, yeah, it's, they're they're making a free to play video game that is also making epic. Like, what was it? How many? How was one point? How much? How much in profit did they make last year? 
Uh, was it? It was some insane. I'm gonna look it up real quick. It's beyond my comprehension, so. Um, we're gonna look this up. It grossed a three billion dollar profit in 2018, oh, yeah. thanks to Fortnite, and it's because of salaried employees working 70 to 100 hour weeks. Um, you know, we we we're hearing about management being um you know, particularly stiff and cruel and uncaring um, in regards to employees' needs. Um, if you and, ask, you can go home, they look at you like you're actively stupid. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was what, a quote in what, the piece. What is a home? Yeah, I highly recommend everybody who's, who's watching live go up into the chat and, um, and, and click that link and, and at least bookmark it to read later because it's, it's, it's amazing um, and it's horrifying. Um, and it's it's funny because we mentioned earlier we we're kind of talking about um, Apex Legends having some difficulty keeping up the pace with Fortnite. Well, uh, Respawn put out was it today or yesterday? Uh, it was this morning. It was this morning. Um, put out a statement, and it, it to me it feels like it's kind of spurred on by this recent piece. You want me yeah, to feel definitely. differently? It definitely was. It felt like a reaction. Yeah. Yes, but um, it it they basically said that. Content updates to Apex Legends will will effectively come at a pace that their employees can realistically work on, and that they're not going to put the um, game updates ahead of the the well being of the people working on that team. Um, and yet, you know, we have this example where Apex Legends is is falling off basically because they're doing the ethical thing and, and treating their workers well, while Epic Games can exploit its workforce so heavily. Pretty much. And and rake in, you know, I mean, a $3 billion profit in a single year, which is insane for a major gaming company. Um, what, what are our options? Like, what do we do as gamers, as press, as, as, as people... Because we hear this time and time again. This is open to anybody who wants to jump in, honestly. But but it, it feels like we're having this conversation over and over again. And it's a different company each time. But it's it's often the same things. We just had the, what was it, Rockstar. We were so outraged at Rockstar being 80-hour yeah, work weeks. Dead, yeah, 80-hour yeah, work weeks. And here we are with Epic Games talking about 100-hour work weeks. And, and NetherRealm in the same week. Yes, yes. And NetherRealm, we've had a couple of former NetherRealm employees, staffers, temps. We don't know the exact positions of these people. I think one of them was a a hired on like contracted temporary yeah. worker for I a mean, project. I mean, you, you had the whole Bioware magic thing a month yeah. ago. Yeah. But to be fair, I, a lot of, of the games industry works on contract workers to avoid um, treating the people working on games like, like company employees. Cause you don't need to give them uh, like, like healthcare. There's a bunch of benefits. You don't have to give them the same benefits as a full-time employee. Um, but we heard from multiple former NetherRealm employees, the team who does the, uh, the Mortal Kombat games. We talk about Mortal Kombat 11. Um, required crunch as a hard mandate for management. No bonuses. Raises so low that they don't even cover cost of living adjustments. Um, we this this one temp was talking about making less than eleven dollars an hour. Um, you know, uh, talk about the one woman's bathroom uh, for their area being converted into uh, an all gender bathroom, and men, uh, you know committing like harassing behavior and 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 just really really difficult things to to read from these these multiple claims um but again like it's just it's just more of what we're talking about with epic games it's just more companies getting to treat their employees pay them like a, a less than eleven dollars an hour you can work at a T-Mobile store <laughs> for yeah. more than that, you know, like yeah, you, don't, you don't need a college degree to. Yeah. You make a lot of places. You make $11 an hour working at Walmart now, Yeah, you know, mm. and these people are, are, are programmers and graphic designers. I mean, Leo, would you work? You're, you're a programmer. Would you work for $11 an hour? No, 
you know, <laughs> are you because you're a woman, are you worth eleven dollars an hour? Like, no. See, yeah. that's the, that's the, the whole thing. Uh, they have they have the skills to make a lot more money, but the company just feeds in people, chews them up, spits them out. I am terrified to do anything more than indie. Yeah. Like if if I you know join a company, I don't know what's gonna become of my mental health and well being from then on. You know, it's yeah. it's scary. I want to be part of this industry, but I, this is scary. Maybe yeah. a little bit more on your own terms. Yeah. 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 So I mean, Matt, you you have been a part of this industry for a long time, inside and out. You have been working within it. You have been observing it. I mean, to you, does it feel like conditions are getting worse or does it feel like a lot of open secrets are getting spoken about more, maybe a little more publicly? What do you get a feel either way or is it just so hard to tell? I, it's super hard to tell. I think all I all I'd say about it is I'm really glad the conversations are happening. And I'm glad people feel comfortable that they can talk about their experiences yeah. um, firsthand. I, I personally, from the publishing side, uh, certainly we put in our fair share of uh, weekends and nights and everything else it took uh, working on Lego Dimensions uh, when I was there. Uh, I mean, I left publishing because uh, I was working so much that I was having health problems and I wasn't able to sleep. Um, so I wanted to leave publishing, but you know, that's totally different. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a good thing that people are talking about it is, uh, I guess the way I'd put it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do you really feel like it's that? Di I mean, I, I don't like to play like pain Olympics or anything. So like if, if you were talking about losing health and, or, or losing sleep and, and having poor health as a result of work hours, like. It kind of sounds like you almost experienced a lot of this firsthand, even if to a lesser degree. Uh, I wouldn't put myself in the same bucket with anyone. The The things I did, I did because I decided I would do that, and no one was pressuring me to do that. I was okay. doing it on my own. So that was my own problem. Um, some of the things people are talking about are not their own problem or their own yeah. decision. So Yeah, we're hearing a lot where people yeah, say totally that it's... Circumstances. People say that it's their decision, but they are getting pressured. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, we, we talked about well, while, while NetherRealm, while the, the multiple former NetherRealm employees talked about, um, you know, managers mandating crunch um, and, and, and making like hard, explicit requirements. Uh, the piece about Epic Games is actually more indicative, I think, of former examples where it's not... So, like I said, it's it's not that you can't take time off. It's that if you do, you're the one that gets fired at the end. So it's yeah. the unspoken rules. Like someone else is doing your work. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and then there's the guilt of of all you're doing is putting it on someone else's plate. It's that, well, we're not putting a gun to your head sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's still, like, coercion. So it takes us back to, I will say, I found it interesting. Um, I've always been a big boycott person myself. And I know we've had this discussion on the show and internally and among friends about that's not like not everyone feels the same way. And you can't really judge people for not jumping on the boycott train because, of course, you do end up hurting the developers. Um, you know, and, and it's it's there's really it feels like there's no good way around it in terms of we're taught to vote with our wallets. Right. But. Voting yeah, with our it's, wallets it's is, is harmful. Yeah. yeah. And never actually conduct a business. Yeah, one of the um one of the people at, at one of the former NetherRealm employees was talking about, hey, please don't boycott Mortal Kombat eleven. Um, don't boycott because the people who are making these harmful decisions are the ones that get paid first. Um which is I don't know, for me an interesting thing to hear from somebody who was in the middle of it, in the middle of the abuse, right? Like, that... I think that holds some power to me that somebody can say that they went through it and then in the same breath turn around and say, this isn't the answer. Um, yeah. it's, it's a very... 
I mean, yeah. everything yeah. I've ever seen from developers, they have made it pretty clear they don't want you to boycott their game. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, but like to even hear from like a, an ex former employee who apparently wasn't involved in Mortal Kombat 11 specifically, um, you know, bring this up like. I don't know, it feels different when it's somebody who's not in it anymore. Yeah, I know what you mean. Okay. Yeah, the degree you. of impartiality, if I probably said that completely wrong, and I blame lack of caffeine, despite the video evidence of me drinking tons of caffeine. Yeah, just earlier. in general, I, whenever the topic of boycotting bad practices comes up, yeah. generally I see the development community not support the boycott movement. Yeah, so let's get real. What, what do we do? Like what can't can yeah, we that, do anything? I, you know, you have the conversation. I guess you just you make it a more welcoming environment for the people who are going through these problems to express, you know, how they feel. To have, yeah. you just have to have a dialogue going because otherwise, like, I, like this is widespread. This, you know, like how many how many studios haven't had their story told yet? Like that we don't know about. Like it, it's so widespread. It's just. It feels like there's just stories waiting to come out, you know, like I feel like Kotaku is going to publish something in two weeks about another studio who crunched through something crazy. So yeah. like the only way it's going to stop is just if you, you know, the developers feel more comfortable, talk about unions, get the, get the, uh, the word out there, you know, get people comfortable with the idea stuff like that. That's all you can yeah. do as, as a gamer, like as, so, as just a consumer. Y'all feel like we need to get more comfortable with that U word? With union, with unionize, basically. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah. I know, I know that. Um, oh, it's just so frustrating. It's hard to keep like my thoughts straight. Um, it's frustrating too. Um, just for the purpose of transparency with our audience, like we struggle internally with how and how often to cover these stories when they come up because. You know, we can only cover the same ground so yeah. many times in so many ways, and yet when when you have all of these conversations happening, it feels like it is... I mean, we're not a big press outlet, but it feels like if you're committed to news, if you have standards, you know, if you have journalistic standards that you can't let something like this, something this important and something that affects this many people go by so you know how, how do we keep presenting this to you all you know who i'm sure it, it's it seems written in the chat that all of you are pretty much on board with what you know most of the rest of us are people need to unionize this is unacceptable but what do we all collectively do other than keep talking about it i think that powerlessness is powerful in a way Oh no, we lost Matt. I scared him off. No, he's coming back. <laughs> Let's give him a second here. Matt, I think I got too real for you for a moment there. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, your uh, your realness killed Discord. Um, I don't know. I think what I would do for for gamers and customers um, as a consumer, you should always support the things you want to support and don't what you don't buy what you want. Um, but just keep in mind that these are people that make these products um, and have some empathy as we should have empathy for everyone all the time anyways. Um, and instead of being, you know, loyal to brands and loyal to boxes, be uh, cognizant of what everyone that are making these products uh, do in order to make sure they get out there. And um, the rest of it has to be up to those employees and employers um, to work these things out. Yeah. I feel like a lot of people get, and, and Lena, I'm sure you see a lot of this, um, but people become very defensive when they have to deal with a game or a company that they like or, or they're excited about. Um, and they find out about something like these poor labor practices they disagree with, um, and there becomes kind of a dissonance between their how they feel about the game versus like wanting to get it right like i want to get mortal Kombat, but oh now i'm you know hearing about nether realm um do you, do you see a lot of that yeah yeah um 
there's a lot of how do I, how do I put this? As far as that stuff goes, you know, there's a lot of people that want to get a game, but they see that, the, that these labor practices are happening, so there's a lot of conflict there. Um, you'll have people that just won't buy anything from a certain company. You have people that will back a company forever, regardless of what's happening. But it's Well, just... and I think it's those more diehard fans that you see get, like, the most upset yeah. in a defensive kind of way when stories like this come out. Um, but yeah. And we, and we need to, we need to be on the side of the people actually working on the games, not the companies themselves as companies, yeah. because you know, when, when workers are treated well and when they are able to do what they do best, they make better products to begin with. So it should be something that everyone wants. And, you know, we want people to want to work in this industry. I want to keep having video games, even though they were a mistake. So, <laughs> um, it's a mistake that can still be corrected. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we just, there are people involved, people make video games and we need to protect them rather than the names and the faces that we see. Yeah, because the majority of people is responsible for the games you play. You'll never see their faces and you'll never remember their names, to be honest with you. Like, that's just the unfortunate name. Ed Boon is not the only person who worked on Mortal Kombat. I hate to break it to you. Like, I curse Todd Howard every day, but he didn't do a lot. <laughs> yeah. <in the> game. <laughs> Brandon, do you feel like we do a good enough job in when we talking about these issues? Do you feel like we do a good enough job at at making sure that people understand that it's not their fault that people don't feel guilt tripped when we talk about these conversations? Do you, do you mean we the we the we like as press, but not even just press. Like if you have any kind of platform and you use it to talk about this issue, you run into defensiveness. Do you think that that people are just going to be defensive no matter what? Uh, or do you I, feel like we could do a better job of of making sure people understand that, like, you're not a bad person for buying this game, right? Because I think that's where a lot of defensiveness comes from. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, I, I don't, I'm not a vote with my wallet kind of guy. Like, if I, if I think something looks good, I will buy it. And, and the other issues are separate, and, you know, I address, address them separately. But it how to deal with like people that get overly defensive like that i I guess you just kind of ignore them (laughs) like they're you know they're gonna do their thing like if they want to go all in on something and just kind of stick their head in the sand you i mean you can't just like pull their head out of the sand like yeah well you're you're a great example um because you you know you say you don't really excuse me do much in terms of like boycotts yeah do you ever feel like the general state of of like capital d discourse talks down to you no like maybe not personally but you, yeah so you no don't... I, I i don't i i feel like generally like you you aren't chastised by the media for enjoying what you enjoy okay even if it, you know it's coming from a I, i'm also of the somewhat opinion like you would never buy anything if everything had to be made under perfect circumstances that's true. There is no ethical consumption under capitalism. How would any of us have shoes or phones? So that's, I mean, that's an unfortunate truth. Um, oh, see, Justin just popped into the chat. What's going on? I see that one of our Avengers has managed to leave. So he's the like, well, he's like, what, two and a half hours into it by now, probably. You know, uh, it's like a three hour movie, right? It's like a three hour oh, comic book movie. I mean, I'll be there on Wednesday. Don't get me wrong. But um, yeah, woof, man. I, it's not unheard of. Like what? The Dark Knight was like two and a half hours. I enjoyed yeah, that. yeah. So I that in a the theater. I could do. I could do Avengers. So my, my favorite movie is Pulp Fiction. That's two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah, I'll is check it, it out on half? Disney Plus or whatever that is in like <laughs> two years. Yep. So I, I think we've we've pretty much. There's really not much more to cover in regards to the labor issue. I mean, we spent a, a, a pretty hefty yeah. chunk of time on that. I mean, it was um, related to like two important games. Oh, games. right. Right. And like I said, everything comes around. We talk about mortal Kombat and it, it, it trying to like keep itself alive as a live service game. And the sheer amount of content that's in that game, that game was as, as beautiful as content it looks with the K mind you. And as much <laughs> content is in there. Like, 
you know, it was built on the backs of temps making eleven dollars an hour. Um, you know, we talk about Fortnite and Apex Legends and and Anthem having to delay um, its updates, and you know, and, and the Division Two doing so well and Ubisoft doing so well at updates, but like. Fortnite is built on the backs of, you know, breaking the backs of its employees and Apex Legends is, is apparently not. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's just not much more to say other than, like, please talk about these issues when they come up. Urge people to unionize. Like, know the BS talking points against unions because there's a lot of, of very hard and grand misinformation out there that explicitly tries to get people to do the anti-union work for them. Um, right. and don't shame people. If, if you believe in boycotts, like there are even people who were victims of that abuse who say that that's not necessarily the option that you should follow. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. If it's, if you feel strongly about it, I'm one of those people. And but, also I, I completely support people's right to boycott. Like it's, yeah. I don't think it's dumb. It's just not something I personally do, but, but like, just try not to, to, to turn that lens against people who don't hold the line so to speak, you know, let's, let's recognize what the actual problem is in this regards. So I want to move to something a little bit lighter. It wasn't on the schedule, but we got some time. <laughs> I know. Um, Matt, we've got you here. Uh, we haven't had you on since the news first broke about PlayStation 5. Um, and there wasn't much news about PlayStation 5, uh, but stuff like backwards compatibility, and the load times and knowing it's definitely coming next year. And you kind of brought up how we're kind of nearing the end of the life cycle on PS4 and Xbox One, and people are kind of anticipating what's coming next. Um, what were your thoughts about Sony getting out early with this information? And was there anything new in there that has maybe changed your expectations for how the next generation moves along? So uh, my guess is that they came out with that information because they knew they were sending dev kits out and that information was going to get out, uh, whether it was going to be from them or from somebody else. So why not get ahead of it? Uh, and you also get ahead of E3 uh, when the news could be out and hot and heavy around June for whatever Microsoft's next box is going to be. So um, in terms of the guts, nothing too surprising. We are still... Uh, 18 months away, maybe, um, from these boxes. So I know people are talking a lot about the price and, oh, an, an SSD is this much now, which means the box is going to have to be that much. I'm not worried about that. A lot can change in 18 months in price point. And whether, you know, the 399 in 2013 is now, what, 449 in 2019? Yeah, I saw the adjusted price. So the PS3 launched at 599 famously. Adjusted now, that's like $750. Yeah, so, like, there's there's room, there's time for all that stuff to be worked out. In terms of the overall, like, was it uh, different than I expected? Not really. It's about what I would expect. I expect Sony to take a very... Sony approach to the next gen and follow what they've done this gen and and one with uh, in terms of global market share uh, with their strategy. So I expect them to, to continue to go down that road. Um, I've been at Sony and at Microsoft in the last eight weeks. Uh, I've asked them both in the rooms to blink once or twice on different mm. days <laughs> and different components and no one blinked for me. So unfortunately they didn't let me in on any hot secrets. Um, but overall, like I'd always expected holiday 2020 for these new boxes. And it looks like that's what we're getting to. Um, I'm expecting like 2 million units of each in the U S market in the launch year. But of course, Microsoft could throw some real interesting curveballs in June in terms of services, in terms of like, if X cloud is going to be, you know, if you're gonna be able to play X cloud games on Xbox one, what impact that might have on what they want to do for next chance. There's a lot of interesting stuff yet to come. Um, but so far, it seems like they got out ahead of the news before someone else could beat them to it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I want you to tell me if this sounds crazy, um, but hearing the PlayStation 5 is, is natively backwards compatible to the PlayStation 4, all of your games, all of your discs, presumably all your digital content will move forward. It'll be a very easy flat replacement for your PlayStation 4 or Pro. Um, my thought process is Xbox really has to do something different than just make 
a more powerful than the PlayStation 5 new Xbox that is also backwards compatible. Um, because Sony is kind of the current market leader in their in the Sony and Microsoft corner of the gaming ecosystem. Uh, I feel like them making their next system backwards compatible basically makes them the default choice for a lot of people, for a lot of traditional gamers. Uh, does that, do you think that that holds water or do you think that that's crazy talk? Well, it depends on what your goal is, right? If your goal is to sell more boxes than the other guys, um, then maybe. But I don't know if that's their goal anymore. Their goal is always users. And if you look at their financial results, they continue to do exceptionally well and continue to grow despite having a sold box disadvantage. Um, and if they can get xCloud and their services on PCs, on other devices, then I don't know if they care if their individual box outsells the other guys. I'm, I'm sure they'd like it to, but I also think they'd be pretty okay if they had a heck of a lot more users than the other guys in some. So I, I think I think we're going to see them go in some very interesting, different new directions and change the rules of the game. Um, See, no, that's exciting. When we're talking about changing the rules, that that sounds like next gen. Because because Game Pass yeah. effectively is is the Xbox plan right now. Correct. Game Pass has been really pulling them back. Even if the actual like boxes sold, as you put it, has not been as high. Uh, do I have that about right? Yeah, it's it's the services, right? It's Game Pass. It's going the ultimate. It's going to be X Cloud. Uh, how all those services tie in together. And of course, you know, they're running PC code. Like, so for example, um, if you buy the, if you buy Forza Horizon 4 on PC, it's the exact same code that runs on Xbox One now. Oh, There's no difference. You, you can't even split, the, you can't even tell in the sales numbers or the, because the, the actual code itself is the same exact product. So That's there's, cool. imp there's implications there too. So if they, if they continue with that, you know, why couldn't, why couldn't Xbox one device play just PC games? If it's, if, if we're at that point, right? Like, I don't know if that's going to be the case, but you can kind of see a path to where things just are different uh, in five years than they are today. And that's not even taking into account what things like Stadia are going to do. Um, to the overall market itself. So, I mean, it's just a lot of exciting things, but a lot of big disruption on the way, I think. So you're kind of anticipating that, that PlayStation 5 is going to be just a literal PlayStation 5 and that Microsoft may continue to follow their path of finding kind of a, a different take and, and kind of subverting people's expectations via services? Yeah, my assumption is that PS5 is going to be a more traditional model, uh, very heavy on what has made the PS4 so fantastic and great. And I think they're going to like play in other spaces like PlayStation Now and, and other services, but, you know, maintain a, a more traditional approach. Whereas I think Microsoft's going to go the completely other direction. And then, of course, there's Nintendo. Um, which is more in co-opetition with those other guys than they are competition because the cross ownership rates are so high and you know the partnerships with things like Minecraft are so successful. Um, like so I mean I wouldn't be at all surprised if we saw X Cloud on the Switch at some point. I don't know if that's gonna be the case, but it, it wouldn't shock me. Um, yeah, so I think it's gonna be very different, but I think yeah, Sony will be the more traditional approach. And I think Microsoft's going to try to be everywhere and see which one really takes off and focus on that. Yeah. Any you two have any other questions for Matt along this topic? Yeah. No. All right. Yeah, I was going to say it's it, this is stuff that's kind of been covered the last couple weeks, but I figured, look, if we got if we got Matt on, let's take this opportunity. This, this is the man, and I mean, your forecasts are. I love to say, like, you're always spot on. Like, I mean, that's that's all that industry experience speaking, right? I'm still trying so, to get mentally prepared for another console generation, like, coming up. 
Like, it feels like the PS4 just came out yesterday to me. It's weird because of how staggered everything's been, where we had, like, the Xbox and the PlayStation 4, and then we got, like, the Wii U is not long before them, but then we had the Switch, and we've also got these these mid-gen upgrade systems, the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One I'm, X. I'm and... just, I'm remembering the absolute circus that was the last-gen console launch. Like, fucking the casification, the fucking, like, the Xbox, the X-Bone. Like, I can't, I, I'm... I'm not sure if I'm looking forward to going through that again or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know about y'all. Um, I'm, you know, I mean, me and Lena are, are still babies in the grand scheme of things. So like, there's been some real growing up since the last generation of PlayStation and Xbox hit, and I don't know that I'm ready for fanboy wars. It, yeah, dude. Fan, <laughs> I participated fan, a little uh, last time, and I'm just not here for it anymore. <laughs> like, there's too much more gray in my hair. I can't do this. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready for it again, dude. Like, it's like, it, it's about something Greg. in the water, dude. It's something in the water. Like it gets people in a certain kind of mood. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, think I'll sit this one out. <laughs> <laughs> we have bigger stuff to talk about. Yeah. I don't I have time to get to that forward. upset about Microsoft versus PlayStation. Like it's news, but I don't need an emotional investment. All right. Um. You know what? We'll call it a little bit early for tonight. We have burned through some news tonight. Thank you, all of you, for showing up. Matt, as always, our favorite and most recurring guest, thank you for showing up to talk and, and share some of your wisdom and expertise with us. It's always a pleasure. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with me. It's always fun. Yeah, especially at the tail end of, like, you've been busy these last couple days. You've been you've been on the road. You've been making addresses. You've been... Yeah, I've been on the road pretty much every week since early January. I've got three more weeks of my tour uh, Minneapolis <laughs> next week, and I'm going back up to the Bay Area the week after that, and then I think I'm finally done um, for a few weeks until you gotta catch so. a ticket to your one man show. Yeah, man, it's 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 something. It's a, it's been a lot of fun. I've been able to visit so many publishers and retailers and and developers. It's uh it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So um, offhand, what is your Twitter at again? Because I never remember. Because I always just start typing your name up in the bar. Matt Matt Piscatella, yeah, it's just Matt Piscatella. It's just Matt Piscatella. It sure is right there. So everybody in in the chat who is and and listening who is not following Matt Piscatella, uh, please do. He provides wonderful, wonderful insight on the gaming industry and on sales. Um, and if this is a passion area for you, uh, absolutely most one of the most important news people you can follow. Uh, and, well, not you're not a news person, but you and one hundred percent less news. bad puns than Zuge X. <laughs> Yeah, Sugar X is, uh, <laughs> I love him, but I, I see I love the puns too, so. But um, yeah, we thank you, you as always, Matt, for coming on. Um, for the rest of you, uh, as always, we do the show every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Uh, you know, we, it's all gaming news. It's all kind of more serious discussion. Um, you can support us on Patreon. We don't have any rewards. It's just out of the goodness of your heart. We do this for free, um, and we do this, and we travel to events like PAX completely out of our own pocket. I paid out of pocket to go to Boston, as did a bunch of others, uh, to get a lot of the interviews and coverage that we got while we were up there. Um, you can also subscribe to us here on Twitch. You get that lovely Saki emote that some people in the chat have and hasn't been spammed because it's been a busy and somber night and no room for silliness. Um, but of course, none of that is uh, required. It's all optional. This is the way to support us. We also just love having you here to watch us and listen. Uh, there we go. See, there it is. Uh, Justin tossing that in chat. Um, so since nobody else has anything else to do, um, anything else to say, you can tell I want to be an Avenger so bad. I'm only <laughs> half here, y'all. You're a nerd. I know it, but I, I don't have a, a response to that. It feels good. <laughs> yeah. It's not always poetry. We don't always agree, but we always keep it real. So until next time, have a good one, y'all. You said that Bye. better than John did. <laughs> a lot better, actually, yeah.